This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker. Um, Charles Giancarlo is Managing Director of Silver Lake, uh, one of the leading private investment companies in the technology sector. And before that, he was Executive Vice President at Cisco. Um, and also, he was the President of the Linksys Division at Cisco. He started at Cisco as Vice President of Business Development, and he developed and, and executed the marketing and acquisition, I'm sorry, the mergers and acquisition strategy of Cisco. And before that, Charles um, founded no less than four companies. He also, in 2008, was the interim um, CEO of Avaya, and he is still the chairman of Avaya's board of directors. He also serves on the board of directors of um, Gerson Lerman Group, as well as Accenture and Netflix. Um, Charles earned his Bachelor's of Science from Brown University in Electrical Engineering and his Master's of Science here at Berkeley, and he also has an MBA from Harvard. With that, please welcome Charles Giancarlo. Thank you. Well, thank you. I want to thank uh, BT and ICLAC uh, for uh, inviting me here today and for the uh, Citrus Center in general for being so hospitable. And also want to congratulate uh, the Venture Lab uh, winners uh, that I understand just got uh, selected uh, today. So congratulations to you. Um, I've been asked to speak about two topics. Uh, one is one of my favorite topics, and the other one is one of my least favorite topics. So my favorite topic is to talk a little bit about where I think that some of the technology, uh, some of the opportunities in the future are going to be for, for new companies in the technology space. And one of my least favorite topics, I've been asked to speak about myself a little bit. So um, and I've been asked to start with that. So I'm going to start with my least favorite uh, topic first. Uh, you heard a little bit about um, how I started. Uh, you know, I'm an electrical engineer, like many, many of you um, in the audience. Um, got my master's here at Berkeley, for which uh, I'm, I'm very grateful. It was a fabulous experience uh, for me. Um, got me started in semiconductors, which is my background. Um, started out, uh, I got my master's in uh, development of mixed signal um, uh, CMOS devices uh, ancient, in ancient times. In fact, I cut RubyLith, which no one, I think, in the room knows what RubyLith uh, is. Uh, that's when you use cameras to make semiconductors. Um, and then uh, afterwards, I went to work in, um, in Germany for Siemens, actually, when Siemens had semiconductors. It's now called Infineon, uh, which was a great experience. It was a European experience. But oddly enough, uh, something that I didn't expect, it turned into a very big management experience for me. And it was, I learned my first lesson about how important management of, of technology was. Uh, because uh, as I was uh, studying um, and working on a new chip, that we were going to make that was for a telecommunications system. It was a codec filter. It coded voice into digital signals. I figured out that the design that they were working on wasn't going to work, just simply wasn't going to work. Uh, but the management insisted that, well, that didn't really matter. We're still going to build this chip because that's what we've decided to do. It was rather German, I have to say. Um, and I said, well, that's, that's silly, of course. Why would we work on a chip that we know is not going to work? Um, and oddly enough, I had to battle. I had to battle, I had to fight this battle, uh, which uh, resulted in a manager being changed and uh, a variety of different things happened, but the uh, successful outcome occurred, which is we produced a new design uh, that was successful and actually turned into a many, uh, you know, over, over a decade of, uh, of success for that company. But I figured out very quickly that it wasn't just enough to be um, an engineer doing your job as you're told, at times you need to, you need to step up and, and take charge when you know things are going, uh, going in the wrong direction. Um, uh, now, I do think that it, it's extremely important for you to, um, and, and, and one thing I will say, and that's an example of it, that life in many ways is a bit of a walk in the woods, meaning that you just never know 
what's going to hit you from around the corner. All sorts of unexpected, um, all sorts of unexpected events, uh, both failures and opportunities. Uh, and it could be completely random for you unless you have some type of compass. And your compass is what it is that you fundamentally in your gut want to achieve. It's, it's the things that you fundamentally believe in and it's the things that you're willing, you know, it's the amount of time and effort that you're willing to put into something and what you're willing to sacrifice uh, along the way. And I think that that becomes a very important, um, that becomes your, your guides, uh, uh, guideposts as you go through life. And for me, right from the time that when I was at Berkeley, what I wanted to do was I wanted to produce uh, useful products. I wanted to have an impact. Uh, and frankly, and, and the people who knew me here at the time knew that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to start a company and build, and build a company. And that's sort of what guided me along the way, in spite of the fact that I had many, many failures uh, along the way. And uh, one, is, uh, one guided the very next step in my life, and that was that with a colleague at Berkeley, uh, Jim Rosenberg, uh, we had developed together this great new, t this new technology that, that we felt was, was something that was gonna be very important for the world. And what it was, was an especially efficient motor controller. It turns out that a large portion of the electricity grid um, is used for running motors. And if you can run them more efficiently, uh, you can, could not only save power, but in this case, you could actually, uh, in the case of the invention we made, you could save generation capacity. And so we thought it was fabulous, and, and it was the proverbial thing where we worked in my mother's garage for, for like nine months, and we had that eureka moment where it, it was working. We actually got it to work, and we could prove it. We have all the waveforms, and it was fabulous. And these are two graduates, uh, master's degrees out of Berkeley, uh, you know, 25 years ago, and we have that eureka moment, and then we look at each other and say, oh no, now what? And we did not have a clue as to how we were gonna build a company or make this thing successful. And it was really sort of at that point a little bit later where I decided to go to business school because I actually needed, I, I decided that I actually needed to have some um, education in business uh, in order for me to be able to achieve what I wanted to achieve. Now, the world was a little bit different back then. When, when we went through engineering school back then, there wasn't the kind of focus there is today on entrepreneurship. On, on building the kinds of skills that you're getting today and in the programs that you're seeing around how to start companies. Silicon Valley, it had the name, but it was still largely uh, in, its, uh, in its infancy. So I went, to, uh, I went to business school, as you heard, and I was pretty much the only high-tech guy at Harvard Business School um, at the time. But I was arrogant enough to when I came out to try and start a company right away. Um, and uh, we, we started a company in the area of, um, of ATM and Sonnet, which were some of the new communications technologies at the time, looking for capital. First mistake was I started it on the East Coast, uh, where, where, where I was from, New Jersey. Uh, so I was working with East Coast venture capitalists. I know that's an oxymoron, but, uh, but, but that's what I was doing. Uh, and, um, and the second mistake was I wasn't very careful with respect to selection of, uh, of management. Uh, that I had gotten uh, involved with a number of people who were, who were good people overall, but not uh, long-term um, uh, experienced hands in starting companies. And uh, be between that and the crash in the stock market in 1987, had my first failure. Uh, and you know, I'd spent about a year and a half, uh, you know, basically on on low low salary, skimping, uh, living living off my wife, um, and it was a it was a real blow in 1987. But what was important was I had learned a lot, uh, and this is, goes to a second thing that I fundamentally believe, is don't let let any failure go to waste. You learn a lot more in a failure than you do from any success. Um, and you, you learn the hallmarks and you learn the warning signs of failure before it starts to happen. So really, as you go through life, and even, if, when you have, even when you have successes, you have small failures along the way, make sure you really internalize those failures, learn the lessons of them so that you don't make the same mistake twice. That, I think that's extremely uh, important advice. So after that, um, not to be deterred, 
um, I joined a, a company in the Valley, came out to California, joined a company in the Valley, and soon after that spun out another company, which was again ATM and Sonnet focused. And this one was uh, uh, a, a reasonable success. I learned a lot along the way, sold it back uh, to the original company, um, and then found myself out of a job because I did not care to go back to the, to the original company. Um, but by that time, I had learned a lot about the telecommunications market, uh, about what, was, uh, what, what can be successful. Uh, and more importantly th than anything else, I think, is I learned over that period of time the way the world really worked rather than the way I imagined it to work. And I think that's, uh, let's say, a third lesson as you, as you go down the path in business is we all start out uh, in the world with certain, I think, fantasies. I think it's rare for people coming right out of school to start with a really clear-eyed, realistic view of the way the world really works. And in fact, that would be quite, um, I think that would be quite unusual for anyone to be able to start out like that. Uh, instead, we start out with a, with a perception of how it could work or should work. And in fact, I think that's one of most of our pitfalls is we say, well, it should work this way. And therefore, we keep, keep on trying to see it as if it does work that way. And in fact, the world works according uh, the way um, uh, 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 you, you learn over time the way the world really works. And in some cases, that's cynical. Uh, in other cases, it's just very realistic and very Darwinistic. But you really need to understand the way it works. You have to learn the way the world really works. And then, once you know how it works, then you can try to change the way the world works. But you can't change the way the world works until you know how it works uh, today. So one of the things uh, I figured out along the way was that um, Ethernet was going to win. It didn't really matter what the, future was what the future standard was. Whatever it was going to be, it was going to be called Ethernet. And so I started with um, uh, a company that had, had had its trouble, had downsized because it couldn't build its product, and had gone from 80 people down to eight, um, called Kalpana. Uh, and uh, uh, a friend of mine who had invested in it asked me to help, and I jumped in. And lo and behold, um, we figured out that we could really make this successful. And this was the company that invented the Ethernet switch, um, and which is eventually how I made my way to Cisco, because about two years after I joined, we had gone from literally zero to a run rate of about $60 million a year. Uh, as I tell people, at one point in time, I had 100% of the Ethernet switch market. Uh, and then I fought for 15 years to try and get that back again. Um, but Cisco bought us in uh, 1994. And again, it was a very mediocre um, acquisition. Um, and uh, I thought, actually, that I was going to leave. And by mediocre acquisition, what I mean to say is that Cisco bought it. But of course, you have people already inside the company who you know, want to be on top, want to be leaders, and so forth. And what they did was they really suppressed the, the management and the employees of the, acquired, uh, of the acquired company. And this was actually rather typical, uh, because at that point in time, in the early, uh, this was the early 90s, uh, and uh, the 20 years prior to that, mergers and acquisitions, any acquisition in the high-tech space always met with failure. All the employees left. They went on to start another company. And the Valley was ripe with companies that had been started from the departed executives and engineers from companies that had been acquired. And uh, at the time, uh, John Chambers, who's CEO of, of Cisco, um, came to me and said, well, I'd like you to start uh, and build a business development organization within Cisco. And I said, why would I want to do that? Everybody knows that M&A doesn't work in high tech. And he said, well, why don't you try to find a way to make it work? And, and that was interesting. It, 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 uh, it, it appealed to one of my great weaknesses, which is a challenge. I hate people giving me a challenge, because usually it means that I'm going to, to take it, in spite of the fact that it's probably not good for me. You know? um, so, so I took it on, in spite of the fact that up until that time, I had been you know, sort of an engineer, an engineering manager, uh, uh, somebody very um, very involved in the operations of a business. And this is clearly more of a staff job. But uh, to be honest with you, Cisco stock was doubling every year. It was a good place to be. I was a little bit tired from all of the startups. So it was a good place to, uh, to I thought, rest for a while, albeit it turned out that it never got to be a rest. Um, and so we took that on. And with the idea being, and, and this may sound odd to you, but for the most part, M&A is run by deal people 
financial people. And what they will do is they'll identify a company that at, the, at a, quote, strategic level makes a lot of sense for another company to buy. In other words, it has a complementary product, or it has a strong development team, or it has, it, it's part of a new marketplace that the other company wants to get into. So they say, strategically, it makes a lot of sense. Let's go buy it. They buy it, and then they say, OK, we won. It's done. And, and then uh, and no more work, in many cases, very little work then goes into making it successful. And my view, especially having been acquired twice and in both times where the, the acquisition was not really um, very pleasant, I looked at it from the other point of view, which is that, well, if you're going to buy something, it doesn't really, any idiot with a checkbook can buy something. The whole point is not buying it. The whole point is making it successful, first of all. And in a high-tech business, where products change every year and where your, you know, your product two years from now is going to be different than the product today, the important assets are the ones that walk out of the door every night. And so the first thing you need to do is, is make sure that the employees that you're acquiring feel completely empowered to continue building great products. And the great thing about Cisco was it had a fabulous sales force. Um, they were like you know, ravenous meat eaters, and any, any new product was like a piece of red meat that you'd hold out to them, and they'd grab that and start selling it. So, so our strategy became really clear, which is you know, we, we were focused on building out the internet, building out IP, and so any product that was synergistic with that or that helped us to expand the reach of IP um, and that had a good development team was something that we were interested in. But then, what we really focused on was the proper integration of that team. We empowered them. We set them up as a separate unit. We allowed them to define you know, the products that they were going to build and the strategy that they were going to follow going forward. And then we in integrated them in with the sales force. And you know, it, it turned out to be a very, very successful strategy for us for, for many, many years. And um, I have to say, it was, a, it was a lot of fun to build. But after, after a couple of years, and I'll try to end this pretty soon. Uh, after a couple of years, I wanted to get back into operations um, and uh, start building products again. So I um, uh, was uh, lucky enough to uh, be able, given an opportunity to do that again at Cisco. Uh, and I took over what was, they called their new commercial group, which was the group sm selling to small, medium business. We did that for a few years. During that period of time, we started um, IP telephony, so the migration of voice from, from TDM systems to IP. We started that in 1997 uh, and, uh, on transport, and then 1998 uh, in terms of PBX or telephone uh, systems. Uh, we started our wireless uh, Wi-Fi activities in 19, uh, 1999. Um, I remember uh, presenting it. My, I would drive my wife crazy because uh, you know I had all this stuff around the house where I, uh, you know, I was the first person basically using wireless um, in, in the home, and people thought I was crazy for saying that you know people are going to go around the house using wireless on their laptops. But you know, obviously, it was something that over time became very, very uh, successful. And then we hit the. Um, and, and we built the, the, the commercial business up to about um, a third of Cisco's revenues at the time, so about eight eight billion dollars. Um, then in 2001, we had the you know historic market crash, which uh, you know m many of you were very young uh, at the time, but uh, it was the nuclear winner of the high tech uh, industry. Uh, just to give you a, a sample of that, um, at the time Cisco was growing 15% um, per quarter about 70% a year, okay? So in the, uh, by, uh, in the October quarter of 2000, we had just grown 15% or you know, annual run rate of, of, almost, of over 70. Um, and it was just continuing at that rate. We were about $25 billion at the time, and we had a market cap of about $400 billion. $400 billion. And by April of the next year, so less than six months later, uh, the stock price was about, at that time, about 65. Uh, six months later, the stock price was about 15. Uh, the market cap was down around uh, $80 billion. Um, the sales had dropped, to, uh, had dropped by 40%. So we were go increasing at 15% per quarter and dropped by 40% in two quarters. I mean, it was just devastating. And of course, 
whole companies just completely went out of, out of uh, business at that time. Uh, and um, as you might imagine, a lot of the businesses that we had started that looked great just six months earlier looked absolutely ridiculous and absurd um, at, the, at that time. So um, at that, as you might imagine, there was a big shakeup um, at the company, and I volunteered for and, and got uh, all the bad businesses. And the reason why I volunteered for it was, uh, to be very honest with you, I didn't trust anybody else with the bad businesses. I knew that they had to be, um, they really had to be dealt with. And dealt with meant, in some cases, shut down. Uh, in other cases, dramatically downsized. Uh, in other cases, you know, just a complete change uh, in direction. Um, and, uh, you know, I cared a lot about the company. And I knew that, you know, the, the parts of the company that could be successful were going to do well, but the parts that what would hurt the company are the parts of the company that were doing badly. And, and so I took that on. Um, we did a number of other things during that time. We started, um, uh, we started our, our entry into the uh, consumer side of the business with, uh, with Linksys, an acquisition of Linksys, which was great fun. And you know, we could take up a, a, a lot of time on that. But, but the Linksys consumer business was growing at just incredible rates. And uh, uh, the retail business was a completely different, um, a different side of things. Um, and, uh, but more importantly was what you had to do in when times were not good. So a lot, of, a lot of what you're studying right now is how do you build a company from scratch. And that's a great skill set. And building companies is something that's very good. But, and this is another lesson I learned that's, that's serving me well now, is you know, at some point in time, especially later on in your career, you have to do other things as well. And there are other ways of helping society. And, and right now, we see this across our, our economy, there are a lot of businesses that had grown large but are no longer well run, right? Or they have other uh, problems. And fixing businesses that are in trouble is also something that's extremely important. And that, those were things that I, I was able to learn during that period of about 2001 to uh, 2003. And um, the other thing I learned is you work really hard when things are going up, and you work really hard when things are going down. So there's no way to get out of that. And so finally, I just said, well, if I'm going to work hard on the way up and work hard on the way down, you've got to pace yourself uh, in your life. And that's something you learn um, that, that I think is extremely important um, as well is in life, you do need to pace yourself. You can't always uh, be running all out. Uh, you got to take time. As, as one board member told me one day, actually, this is a funny story. He said, Charlie, you look terrible. Uh, and this was a fellow, he was about 65, 70 years of age, in very good shape. And he was the CEO of, of a you know, Fortune 100 company. And, and he said, look, Charlie, he goes, if you keel over and die, you're not going to be helping anyone. You know, not, not, not the company, certainly not your family. So you got to take better care of yourself. And I think that's generally true, is you got to make sure that you take care of yourself. So let me just try to uh, close, this, uh, close this, this chapter on, on my life. Um, as, as uh, BT mentioned, you know, I, I got to the point where I was running all of our uh, all of development and uh, all of the products, uh, all the divisions within Cisco, which was which was great fun. Um, when I got that job, it took me about 30 days to realize that I had been promoted from engineer to sociologist. It was uh, it was no longer a case where you could go to people and tell them exactly what to do. Now, first of all, there were way too many people to be able to do that with. But secondly, you were then managing people who had their own opinions about things uh, and who were very strong. And what I realized is that um, my job really was about creating an environment where people did the right things, where people knew what the right thing to do was and were able to do that and decide that on their own. And also an environment that people were excited about, were enthusiastic about, wanted to stay, where they uh, felt that it was the right place for them on a long-term basis, and most importantly, where they felt like they'd be rewarded for the right type of, of behavior. So in spite of the fact that OB, or organizational behavior, was the only course I flunked during, during uh, business school, I'd learned that actually it's probably one of the most important things as you start to build larger and larger companies. Because at some point in your life, you get to the point where it's not what you do, it's what your team does underneath you that determines um, success or failure. 
So let me, oh, let me just mention a few things about Silver Lake. So I left uh, Cisco, it was the, uh, for me, it just was the right time to leave at the end of 2007. And I joined uh, Silver Lake Partners. Now, a, a big reason why I joined them, frankly, was uh, that I had uh, uh, quite a few friends there who I enjoy working with. So, uh, you know, the partnership, um, the camaraderie is very important to me. Part of it was that I really did feel, uh, and, and a, what a private equity group does, uh, let me just explain that for a moment. Private equity is a little bit different than venture capital. They're both investors, but if venture capital is about the birth of companies, private equity is about the rebirth of companies. We buy companies that, there are reasons why we get to buy the companies we get to buy. Usually they're down on their luck, their industry's in trouble, uh, th they've had poor management, they're not operating well, um, and therefore, they're, um, therefore they're, they're, they're affordable for us to buy, but most importantly, we, we buy companies that we think have either, um, you know, they're in a great market, have the ability to be restructured, have the ability to be improved, and have the ability over time to be successful again. And so uh, we, we buy companies, we invest in them, sometimes we in, uh, buy several companies, put them together, sometimes we buy divisions out of larger companies and spin them out and have them be standalone companies. But one way or another, our focus is on improving the operations of companies, and we only focus on high tech. Silver Lake only focuses on high tech in the private equity uh, market. And, and that's been, uh, I, I've enjoyed it quite a bit, as BT mentioned, um, in spite of the fact that this was not a feature of joining. Um, I uh, took over one of, their, one of their portfolio companies on a temporary basis uh, called Avaya. Uh, it's an interesting case study because it was the worst operating company I'd ever seen up until that point. Uh, I called it, and I, I said this right in front of their employees, that it was a museum of discredited business practices. Um, it was one of the spin outs from AT&T and Lucent. And I felt like I had gone from teaching graduate school at Cisco where we were innovating on the forefront of business to teaching kindergarten uh, in terms of just getting down to basics of, of business. How do you run a supply chain? You know, how do you run a sales planning process? How do you run, you know, just a business meeting? I mean, really very, very basic stuff. But it turns out that when it's that basic, and they had a, fundamentally a very good business, uh, you can affect a turnaround relatively quickly. And we've doubled the profitability in, in a year of that company, n now to the point where they're buying uh, the division of Nortel that's in a similar business. And, and, um, and I think we're gonna be making them uh, very, very successful um, over time. And then the final thing I'll just mention uh, at Silver Lake, because I think it be, uh, might be of interest, is we just recently announced um, our intent, and this should close in the next four to six weeks, our intent to buy uh, Skype. Again, a spin out of, um, from eBay, uh, and something that you know, we think that it's sort of been a withering flower uh, within, within eBay. And once we're able to take it out and run it separately as a focused business, that we're gonna be able to make it, allow it to grow and get into new business areas you know, very, very successfully. So that's gonna be, we think, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of fun. So let me just, let me stop there. Let me talk a little bit about where I see technology going, because as you might imagine, um, at, at Cisco, um, you know, we were constantly in the process of developing new markets and, and new technology. And that was something that, uh, that I think the entire company, and, and certainly I enjoyed uh, very much as we, as we went through. And you, you, you'll notice right away that I'm, I'm more of a hardware guy than a software guy, so I may, my, my opinions may be a bit biased uh, in that direction. But uh, you know, one of the ones that uh, we're very excited about, I've, I'm personally very excited about, is video. And uh, I know that sounds like a very broad topic, but it is a very broad topic, and I'm excited about many different aspects of it. Uh, IPTV, or the delivery of a video um, over, over the internet, over IP to homes and portable devices and, and mobile devices, I think it's gonna continue to expand in the future. And despite YouTube, you know, so YouTube's been done, but there are many, many more opportunities in that space. One of the, one of the last things we created at Cisco before I left was telepresence. Uh, which was great fun, and if you haven't seen it yet, it's really quite remarkable. You can go into like any kind of small meeting room and have a meeting with people that are in across the other side of the world, and it feels like they're in the same room uh, with you. Uh, and I mean, it really feels like they're in the same room with you, and you can have hours and hours of meetings um, and, and, uh, and not get tired as you can in a normal video conference. And I believe that's gonna be going to the home 
your children will be meeting with grandma, I guarantee it, through, uh, through telepresence in your home. So video on that side, um, vi uh, video in terms of delivery, um, uh, you know, across uh, the world in terms of IPTV, and even, you know, pr uh, personal, uh, being able to be your own broadcaster um, out of your home to huge populations, that's going to be there as well. So video is, I think, a very exciting space. Uh, another very exciting space is software as a service. And it's not just about reducing costs instead of operating the servers yourself or operating and buying the software and operating that yourself, having it be off-site. It's not just about that. What, it, what it's really about is creating whole new <coughs> ecosystems of, of partners that are able to share the same database, the same information in a confidential way. Because today, as you might know, within a co the companies are largely horizontally structured. Meaning that, for example, Cisco, uh, just to use uh, an example I know very well, makes equipment, but really what we do is we design equipment. It's made by manufacturers in China, third parties, it's sold by distributors and resellers who are separate parties, people like IBM and HP, um, and it's sold to end user customers. We buy chips from other manufacturers, we buy other components from other manufacturers. So as you see, we have our place in an overall value chain. And the communication between Cisco and other layers in that value chain is through very thin information pipes. Within a company, within Cisco, within our suppliers, everything's wired. You know, every penny that's spent goes into an SAP or Oracle information system, and you're able to analyze this information to create huge efficiencies within your own organization. But across a supply and delivery chain, you have very thin information pipes, meaning that there's a lot of inefficiencies between the ultimate source of a product, sand, and between the ultimate sale of the product to a user. And those in a fit, SAS can really improve those because instead of tiny little pipes of information between these horizontal layers, SAS can create marketplaces and share information between these layers. And because it can create greater efficiencies in the marketplace, it's going to be very successful over time. But like any new software construct, it's gonna take a decade or more to really play it, it, it itself out. So SAS is very exciting. Another one is virtualization. And I know that's, that's a big topic uh, everywhere. Uh, and in spite of uh, VMware and Zen and so forth, it's still very much um, in its infancy. Servers, for the most part, in data centers are still defined by you know, a metal box you know, with a set of processors in it and an operating system that is largely confined to that metal box. And if you think about it, why should that be a, the case? Why shouldn't the operating system really comprise the entire data center? Every processor, every virtual processor in the entire data center, why shouldn't the memory access be all of the memory resident on all of the, on, on all of the cards and all of the disks that exist inside that data center? It, it really should. So virtualization really needs to grow up now, uh, not just be the um, division of one hardware processor into multiple virtual processors, but actually the union of many hardware processors into one or more virtual processors. And that's a huge computer science problem that has only, begun, uh, has only been started uh, right now. And so there's a lot of opportunity um, there as well. Um, I'm very excited about, in the enterprise space, about unified communications, meaning collaboration uh, tools to make it much easier for distributed work groups to be able to, to uh, work together, uh, record what they're doing, uh, be able to analyze it to remove a lot of the, uh, the paperwork and the bookkeeping around managing projects uh, between interactions uh, between people. Uh, and I think we're going to see a lot of uh, uh, a lot of innovation around that space over, over the next uh, several years. Um, uh, I'm, I'm still very excited about the consumer space, although I, I will say that the consumer space is probably one of the most difficult uh, areas in which to start or run a company. And it's because consumers are uh, very fad oriented, not loyal, um, and um, will quickly migrate from one device or one software program uh, uh, to another, and so prove, and you can be a hit uh, one year, and absolutely a dog the next year if you don't follow up a hit 
with yet another hit. So it's a, it's a very um, exhausting uh, business and one that really requires a lot of, uh, a, a lot of staying power. Um, so I think, let me just stop there for a while um, and, and uh, uh, we're gonna leave the rest of the time for questions and answers. And I'd be glad to answer any, any questions you might have. Yes. <coughs> yeah. So do you have any advice on, um, on dealing, like, say that you, were, you came upon, like, a small company that had been around for a while, kind of had a lot of political issues with the management, maybe a lot of old practices. Um, what, what suggestions would you have on maybe uh, bring, bringing that up and making it um, better? better? Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, I had, uh, uh, the thing I just did with Avaya was very, very similar to that, right? Uh, there are several things that, that generally are going on when you have any kind of turnaround situation. Uh, one is that um, what you generally find in companies that are failing is that it's not usually just one person, let's say just the president or the CEO, but usually you have some degree of dysfunction throughout the entire uh, man management team. I think the first thing you need to do, do is define a strategy and define a set of goals that are clearly communicated throughout the entire company. That is extremely important. A lot of times um, what you find in these companies is that um, they don't have single goals. There are different groups within the company that have different and divergent goals. Some of those goals, by the way, are completely non-productive. They may be political in nature. Gee, I think I will get ahead, you know, if I try to, um, if I try to make this project in the other group fail. And that's a, you know, that's a sign of real dysfunction um, inside of companies. So the first thing you need to do is absolutely define a, a common set of goals based around business principles, like growing sales, coming out with a new product, uh, delivering better customer service, but being really focused on the end result, being really focused on the customer. The second thing then is you really do need to analyze the, um, uh, the management dynamic that's going on between all these different players. Um, there is uh, uh, a very clear rule, which is you cannot change culture in a company or anywhere without changing people. And it, it's, it's unfortunately true, but I think it's easy to understand. And that is that even if you have good people in a dysfunctional environment, the social pressure around them to continue operating the same way they operated yesterday is so strong that it's even difficult for good people to behave differently. So until, you're, until you actually change some people out, um, either people don't believe that things are going to change, um, or there's so much social pressure for them to continue to conform, they're not going to change. So you have to change people. You have to clearly communicate what good behavior um, looks like. Um, you have to clearly communicate a focus on on, on the customer, and then, and then you need to, to change the dynamic. Sometimes changing the dynamic is just reorganizing the company sometimes because it needs to be reorganized, sometimes just to change the players so no one is in their comfort zone and you break up whatever um, political loyalties uh, might exist uh, among those players. But you do have to change the dynamic um, uh, extensively. A third thing is, and I'm, I'm a very strong believer in what I call operational excellence. And what I mean by that is every function in the company. Now, of course, it could be development or it could be you know, sales and manufacturing where you want to manufacture you know, at very low cost, right? But frankly, it's also the HR function. How well is that operating? It could be the finance function. How efficient are they? How good are, is the reporting, uh, are the reports that they give to the managers who need those reports to run their business, right? Every function in the company should be operating at an excellent level compared to best in class. Best in class may be a competitor or best in class could be um, somebody in a completely different business. And you can get those numbers. And, and in fact, something you have your teams do is, is have them go search who does it best in class and then how do they do it and what are the lessons from that. And then you set a, a, a goal for them to reach that level. So I'll, I'll tell a small anecdote. Again, it was Avaya and they were running their service organization at 38% gross margin, meaning that if they sold a dollar of service, um, it cost them 62 cents to deliver that service, right? Now, I happen to know, because I had been in that business with Cisco, that best in class was well in the 60s, in fact, in, in the 70s for that, right? And I knew, I, I knew a lot about what they were doing wrong, but I couldn't fix it myself with a lot of different people. So we talked about it, we, I, we changed the person who was in charge, 
And they were running at 38, and we said, well, gee, and to get to best in class, we have to be over 60 uh, to get to best in class. Now, how much time do we want to take to get over 60? Their plan was to improve their performance by 2% that year, so to go from 38 to 40. That was their plan. And I thought, gee, if you need to get the best in class and you give them like five years to do it, well, they, they're not going to do anything differently, right? I thought two years was a fair amount of time. So that meant that in order to get to 60, over 60 in two years, they had to get to 50 in one year. So that was the plan. They had to get to 50 in one year. And someone, um, one level, you know, not, my, not the person in charge of service, but one level down from them, uh, you know, in a meeting that they had, called me completely irresponsible because I'd break the company by doing it. Well, a lot of things happened, but one year later, the gross margin was 51%, uh, and on its way to 60%. So setting the right goals and challenging people, everybody wants to achieve. And uh, my old boss used to say, never, um, never insult a good team by giving them goals that are too low. So you really want to challenge a team with uh, strong goals. Yes. Um, during the earlier part of the conversation, you said that um, when you're young, you have certain imaginations of how the world should be. Um, but when you go out to the real world, you realize the world doesn't work the way you imagine it to be. What are some of the incidents that change your view with this statement with regard to this issue? Well, you know, one of my views, and I agree this was very naive uh, when, when, when I uh, got out of school, was, you know, I sort of believed the, the old... Um, the old saying, you know, build a better mouse trap and the, and the world will beat a, a path to your door. And the fact of the matter is that um, you can build a better mouse trap, but there are all sorts of reasons why that could fail. Um, and it could fail because you have a, a, a relatively weak management team. It could fail because you don't have the right ba financial backing uh, from, from people that can stick with you through all the different phases of needing to raise capital. It could fail because the, um, the cost of change for a customer to change from what they're currently doing to using your product may just be too high. Um, it, it could fail because uh, you don't have a strong uh, marketing campaign or it's too expensive to get to the set of customers that you need to with the information that they would need to make a different decision. So really understanding, and, and so again, you know, it, it, it shows you a little bit of my bias, which is thinking through all the possible cases of failure so that you can either eliminate those as possibilities or you can put in place uh, plans and mechanisms and strategies for dealing with those, you know, is an extremely important uh, part of business planning. You know, uh, and I do think that uh, I have to say, you know, I, I love being with Cisco. I thought it was a, it, it, I think it remains one of the um, the best uh, companies at execution in the business. And I can tell you, and this is an interesting um, uh, comparison. At Cisco, we'd spend about 10% of the time talking about what we did well or our successes, and 90% of, of the time about how bad we were and how we were failing and what our problems were. 90% of the time on the, on the things that were hard. Um, at Avaya, by contrast, they talked 90% of the time about how great they were doing. Um, and, and I think that's a, that's, that's a lesson, right? Business, I, I think another um, common misperception, especially when you go to businesses, and you know, if you believe the PR of businesses, right, all these businesses are great at what they do, and they operate great companies. And the fact of the matter is that all companies are broken at one level or another. And most of what you'll do in business and engineering is fix things constantly. You're constantly fixing uh, problems that are in the business. And if you're not fixing problems, they're just piling up. I mean, a business is like any other piece of machinery you know, that just gets old and, and, and gets worn over time and starts to break down. And your role as a, as a manager is to identify those things before they break and start fixing them before they start to become real problems. And I think one of the fantasies you have when going into a business is that, no, the, 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 real, the, real, um, the way things should be is things should be operating smoothly. And the fact of the matter is you wake up one day realizing that, no, everything's always broken all the time, and your job is just to make sure it doesn't run off the tracks. Uh, and, and fix it, you know, you wanna get it to be um, a really good operation, but you can only do that by constantly fixing things. So those are just a couple examples. 
Yes. I was very interested by your comment on the consumer space. Yeah. That it was an area where there wasn't loyalty and things like that. Um, in some ways, a lot of products can be seen as either fitting into the consumer space or into the yeah. you know, business space. For example, like Ethernet, you could think of it as you know lots of people are going to use Ethernet to access the network. Yeah. Right? Yes. Or you can think of it more in the business space. Could you talk about how? What it means to focus on the business space, to move away from the consumer space? I think you hit upon two of the things that are, uh, you know, um, or one of the things that is a very strong um, rule in, uh, in, in at least commerce and at least in the U.S., right? And that is a successful business either starts and becomes successful either in the consumer space or in the business space, the enterprise space. There's actually also the service provider uh, area and then migrates to the other one. But what you find when you look at these companies is their real strength is in one space or another. And I think a great example of this is Apple and Microsoft, okay? Microsoft is really strong in the enterprise space. And because of that strength, it's kind of found its way down into the consumer space. But I don't think anybody would call Microsoft a great consumer uh, company, right? Apple, on the other hand, is a great consumer company. You know, because of that, they find their way into the business space. Uh, but they don't focus on the business space at all, right? In fact, if you go into CIOs, generally they don't care for Apple because Apple doesn't cater to their desires. And it's almost impossible to find a company that's good at both. Now, you might say, now, why is that? And the fact is that the business processes, and this is, at the end of the day, the thing that limits any company, the business processes that you need, that you operate by to be successful in the business space are just different than what you need to be successful in the consumer space. Let me give you one example. In the business space, um, if there's a bug in your software and a customer calls and says, your software has this bug and it's keeping me from closing my books, you send engineers out there and you put a patch in place within 24 hours and you get that customer back up again. If you don't, over time, you're gonna go out of business, right? The consumer space, a consumer call says, I have this bug and it's keeping me from making my appointment tomorrow. Who do you call? I mean, they don't even answer the phone, right? Maybe, maybe it'll get logged down and maybe, you know, a year from now in, you know, Leopard, you know, 12, you know, may, maybe it'll get fixed and maybe not, right? I mean, it's just entirely different. In, in one case, you really listen to your customers. You know, in the other case, you don't. You look at market trends. You look at where, where things are going. It's, it's much more general trends. One case is very marketing oriented, you know, creating buzz and hype and commercials. In the other case, it's about sales. And what sales means is not like used car sales. Sales in an enterprise sense are people who are generally technically trained. They help the customer to define the problem, to understand what the solution's got to be, to integrate the solution into their environment, right? I mean, it's a lot of hands-on direct work. And it turns out that SMB is sort of in the middle. And SMB is expensive to sell to, and therefore is not a market in, in and of itself. It's either enterprise down. In other words, they either take enterprise products that have been designed for big companies, and then they use them, or they, design, or they are uh, consumer up. They take products that have been designed for the consumer and use it in, in small business. So I, I think that's a, you know, it's, it's a very good point, and it's either one or the other, and I've never seen a company be good in both. Yeah. Whatever happened to those electric motor controllers in your <laughs> yes. Well, it, it turns out that uh, the the, uh, the motor control companies eventually uh, got it themselves. Uh, you know, maybe maybe five or six years later. But after I'd gone to business school, I kind of we kind of lost track of it, and you know, we went off in in other directions. But basically, what they were was three phase uh, frequency converters for power, right? So it would, and they did both frequency uh, conversion as well as phase. Uh, phase change, so you could make an inductive load look like a, a resistive, uh, resistive load, um, and do it much more uh, efficiently than by going to a DC motor, right? If, especially if you wanted variable speed. So, but eventually, um, ev eventually the motor control companies figured it out for themselves. So, thanks for asking. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry to bore you for the whole hour. <laughs> <laughs>